um, IGF um, on health implications of the role of internet governance in the age of uncertainty. This is the, the title of this uh, session. The session aims at discussing roles that digital public policy can have in preserving and improving the global public health, particularly in emergency situations. My name is Patrick Leusch. I'm the head of European Affairs at Director General's Office of Germany's International Broadcaster Deutsche Welle, based in Bonn and Germany. The, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that the development of digital technology can make our societies maybe more resilient to these global health threats. We have been fast learner uh, in, the, in the past months, I think, uh, the whole um, health community, but also citizens have adopted to very new situations. And we have seen grown a lot of digital tools also that could help people and the health system to manage this, this crisis. However, if technologies are accompanied by ineffective digital policies, then these can have detrimental effects on society. So I think we are all in, on a way uh, to, to something and um, no state uh, on earth, no health system, um, no operator was really up to, to see what the digital potential is to, to manage that uh, pandemic. Uh, my guests will exchange views on the role of the internet and digital technologies uh, and what it can have for a role to improve people's health on one hand. Challenges and future of telemedicine is an interesting point, obviously, that goes far beyond um, this, this specific pandemic. And a, a local and global stakeholder responses to deployment of digital public policy for public health. This are some of the topics that we will dis dis discuss in the, in the next 90 minutes. Uh, here is the leading question for that session. Could digital be the key to achieving sustainable development goal number three of the SDGs to ensure healthy life and promote well-being for all at all stages and all this uh, under the impression of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic? So here are our guests. First of all, let me welcome um, Mrs. Anurada Gupta, Deputy CEO of the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, uh, today called Gavi. Thank you very much for being with us. I very much welcome uh, Kira Radinsky. She is Chairwoman and CTO of Diagnostics Robotics uh, in Jerusalem, which she co-founded in 2017. She's an inventor and entrepreneur specializing in predictive data mining. Kira gained some recognition after her software predicted the first in 130 years outbreak of cholera in Cuba. Um, we have um, among us uh, Mrs. Precious Matoso Malebona. She is director of the Health Regulatory Science Platform at the University of Witzwatersrand, South Africa and uh, also uh, in the World Health Organization director responsible for the development and implementation of the global strategy and plan of action on public health. We have uh, with us uh, Mr. Bernardo Mariano, director of digital health and innovation and chief information officer at uh, WHO. In this role, he is responsible for coordinating uh, WHO's digital health vision and strategy very warm. Welcome, looking forward to your contribution. And last but not least, we are connected to Dr. Anurag Agrawal. He is director of the CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology in New Delhi, India. And he is also a member of the WHO Digital Health Advisory Group. So this is a great panel and we are looking forward to your insights. Um, while we speak, I'm asking you to uh, mute your microphones and uh, keep your cameras on to guarantee smooth running of the of these digital sessions. But I assume you all are be, have become, in the meanwhile, expert, experts of this kind of uh, unusual con conversation, which turns to be the, the new normal. It it, it seems. So um, thank you very much uh, for uh, taking part in this in this panel. 
Um, so here, let, let, let's start. Um, in, in recent times, I think we agree all that nothing has challenged the health systems as the COVID-19 pandemic and many countries were more well overwhelmed with a rapidly growing number of infectious cases with high death rates. And we have witnessed the heroic work of medical workers around the world, but also their extortion. It's not surprising that many health systems turned to digital um, very soon to cover these uh, challenges. Apps were released, databases created or improved, health information systems improved and, and the likes. There has been a range of, of measures that have been taken more or less soon with more or less uh, power and more or less um, systematic approach. We have seen how digital technologies have been deployed to help fight the pandemic in a, as a whole. So what is your experience in this regard? How have digital technologies helped so far the health systems in, in times of the, of the pandemic? Give us an assessment how, how big is the link and how big is the contribution of digital systems to manage this, uh, this, this pandemic? And I'm turning this question to Bernardo Mariano, Director of Digital Health and Innovation and Chief Information Officer of the WHO organization first. Bernardo, please come in, turn your microphone on and come in. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. And happy to be here. Let me just start by saying that, uh, that uh, we at WHO, we promote the use of digital health technologies and appropriate use, I have to say. Appropriate use means it should be people-centered, trust-based, privacy and ethical-based, evidence-based, effective, sustainable, inclusive, and equitable, as well as contextualized to the to the to the to where we 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 are using that technology. At WHO, I wanted to also say that since the pandemic, we have witnessed uh, a, a great collaboration across uh, sectors. We had uh, uh, a good support from uh, uh, our traditional partners, the other UN agencies such, such as ITU, uh, but also most important from the private sector. We had a, 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 a good, good support from, 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 from the private sector, but the, it doesn't need to take a pandemic for us to work in a collaborative way. We should actually have done that earlier. And preparedness is key because if we had done earlier, we would do much, much better in this pandemic. Now, how did we, the, the, how did we, what was the experience on it and how it helped health systems? Let me take you to three areas. One, one which is the people centric, the other one, which is uh, value add to existing, is the existing health system, and but also how to build uh, a stronger health workforce. So in these three areas, I just want to, to say that uh, Currently, we are working with a number of countries, as, as well as the G20 can, countries, to, to look at how we can leverage on telemedicine to support um, 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 uh, health systems national, at, at national, subnational level. We didn't, the technology is mature enough, but we need to uh, adjust policies and regulations to really leverage on that. So we're working with a number of countries on, on that. But early in the year, we had a lot of uh, uh, calls from, from contact tracing as, as test track and tracing was happening and, and digital technology helped there. So at WHO, we published a, 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 guideline on, a, a guide on ethical consideration uh, for, of use of proximity tracking technologies for COVID contact tracing, for instance. This is what was a, a topic that our member states, a lot of countries were grappling with. How can we make sure that, that those technologies have support uh, uh, the, the current pandemic. Of course, contact tracing has to be an integral part of public health response, because if it is not, then it doesn't add the value. It, 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 and it doesn't, we don't leverage in that potential that it has. But as part of the pandemic, we also started working with uh, Estonia 
to develop a digitally enhanced international certificate of vaccination as we start thinking on, on vaccination, international certificate of vaccination, which currently is the yellow vaccine card for uh, where some 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 people, especially living in, in developing countries, where the yellow yellow vaccination card is required, they you know, know very well. Others that perhaps might not know, but this is the only adult inter, uh, vaccination card that uh, that uh, that uh, that can 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 kids is recognized across borders. So, so we want a digital enhanced um, vaccination card. We also started piloting a digital clearinghouse to help countries to navigate across the myriad of solutions that are, are put to them in over, you know, on, in, on innovation and other areas that to, 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 to try to support and, and, uh, and, 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 and help countries to navigate and manage this pandemic well. The last part, which is the strong health workforce, we fast-tracked the WHO Academy, the launch of a WHO Academy, which has is a, a, a strong digital component. But also, we we in, added a number of tra um, um, trainings on, on on our Open WHO Academy. So it's, a, it's a open WHO.org, which is a, a learning platform that provides online training in 17 different 40 sorry 41 different languages with 17 different topics on COVID, and and has currently 4.5 million users benefiting from that. So all to say that we 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 ramped up, we accelerate the use of digital technologies during the pandemic, but we could do better, and we can do better, and we can do much better to prepare for the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, first insights, uh, Bernardo. You have mentioned a couple of points, particularly um, the people-centered, trust-based, in, in, in inclusive. Um, this is this is very demanding when 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 you have to cover the world. So, um, what is the main aspect um, that you, as a WHO organization, are, are, are seeing in in this in this uh, deliverable um, to 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 people? Is it more to have same standards from technology basis, or is it more to improve? The political systems in, in in governing this kind of technologies. You have said the performance of of the technology is there. The lack is is elsewhere. Yeah, indeed. Let's say let's let's recognize that the digital uh, maturity of countries is very important as we look at uh, how do we support. Uh, countries moving, moving, uh, maturing to the progress. So also, we are witnessing and living a digital transformation of healthcare sector. Within that, each one of us has a role uh, 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 to play, and we have an added value to bring, that to bring to the table. At WHO, we look, look at how, for instance, in, look at how to address the interoperability challenges that every country have. Health is siloed by tradition, so digital technologies to leverage on them and really use them to accelerate SDG uh, related to health, we need that interoperability to work. So, so we have the mandate yesterday, uh, member states approved the global strategy on digital health. So within that, we want to make sure that uh, the investments on digital health and maturity of digital health allow countries to move from the current maturity level to the next one. So countries at different stage, but then then we issued as well in, in digital health investment guide, um, uh, implementation guide investment implementation investment guide so which allow us to say if your maturity is at this level the investment should they have that path we want to see the added value a year from now where that maturity is increased from where it was to where it should be. And if not, so they may take action. So yes, we, we will understand that it comes at a different stage and we need to work together to ensure that uh, we bring them to that maturity level that we all want. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much so far. Um, let, let me pick one aspect that you mentioned also and jump over to, to, to Kira, as, as you mentioned that an interesting point here is the, the collaboration with the private sector that, that has been obviously boosted by the uh, by, by the pandemic uh, from the public health perspective to in, increase relations with the uh, with, with the private sector. Uh, Kira, as as a chairwoman of of, uh, of a startup, 
I don't know if the startup is correct, but the private company that has been involved very early in the management of the COVID crisis. Is there any detection that you have on particularly that link from public health to the to the private sector where things had moved forward to 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 become a little bit more speedy or a little bit more uh, how to say better the link between the industries? Right. So first of all, uh, Diagnostic Robotics has been building triage systems for the last few years. The way the system worked, they are trying based on historical 76 million historical medical visits obtained from the healthcare system, uh, both in Israel and the United States with additional 60 billion claim data. The system, what it knows is to ask triage questions and predict the urgency of the patient and where in the medical setting the patient needs to be navigated. The concept was to reduce the routine work doctors were doing for years, if not centuries. And uh, what we've seen, especially during this pandemic, is that the scalability of physicians came to the maximum. In other words, we understand that we cannot continue in the same way we started before. We have a shortage of 100,000 primary care physicians in the United States alone. So we cannot just continue training more doctors and assuming they're going to be enough for the growing population. Until 2030, we're going to have 3.8 billion people without access to primary care. It actually means that the 3.6 hours that people are waiting right now inside the emergency departments in the Western world, it's going to be very quickly more than eight hours. And it's not a prediction. It's just a fact because in different locations in the world, this is how long patients are waiting. And during COVID, it became even more severe. You have an entire population in crisis that needs to be triaged almost immediately. They need to know where to go to the emergency department, stay at home, lockdown, what should they do? And there is just not enough call centers to answer everybody. And this is where the uh, contact applications come into place. Is this okay to actually monitor people? Or do we actually wanna monitor all them just clinically? So what we started doing is extending our triage service, to start automating all of these processes. Every time a person needed any interaction with the healthcare system, our system would ask them a set of triage questions. For that, should they go to the emergency department? If, they did, uh, if the system signed the past that patients like them usually deteriorate, stay at home. But most importantly, predict for the government which cities are in a very bad trend. In other words, give recommendations around differential lockdowns. It was very much at the beginning of the pandemic when we actually deployed the system. It was used as a decision support system at the beginning of knowing where to send COVID tests because we just didn't have enough. During the second wave, it was around differential lockdowns so we can actually make economy work faster. And I think this collaboration between government and a private sector, where the, the private sector is providing tools for decision making, has been accelerated significantly during COVID. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, the question was, um, I, I understand clearly that um, the, the, the effect of, 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 of your work, have you had the impression that um, despite the fact that you have not started working in this sector um, uh, just with the, with the pandemic, uh, but is there, from your perspective, is there any uh, learning or improvement in the, in, in, in the relations between private sector and public sector in that regard? I think this is a lot that we need to still uh, improve, right? Uh, the, the only thing that a private sector like us can do is provide recommendations. It doesn't mean that the decision makers gonna follow this. They have a lot of political aspects that they need to cover that became so significant during COVID times that it outgrew some of the scientific recommendations done by either the private sector, academic sector, and uh, even the healthcare system uh, as an whole. Uh, so here we actually need to think at what time do we want the scientific knowledge to overcome political aspirations? I think this is the main issue that we saw specifically in Israel that uh, companies have predicted, research have predicted that we're deteriorating but still no action was taken. Uh, conspiration uh, uh, theories about the fact that well, there is no COVID, uh, lockdowns do not help. We even have proofs from data showing that interventions of lockdowns significantly caused a lower uh, impact of COVID in certain locations. Uh, but still, we as a scientific community, we need to also think how we clearly communicate with the governmental agencies to give them this information so they can take action. In other words, 
For example, it wasn't clear if going back to school is actually causing or not deterioration in COVID. Uh, very uh, lately, it was shown that for children under the age of 10, they get COVID uh, two times less than adults, but still no study shows how uh, infectious they are. Mm -hmm. So I still think that we need to supply more information, uh, more uh, with speed because it will create less trust between the decision-making and the private uh, and research community. Thank you very much, Kira. I think that is a very interesting point, the relation between politics, science, digital, and uh, relating to, to trust, because as uh, Bernardo also mentioned, a couple of questions uh, regarding the, the use of digital technologies and for, for health is, is really the, 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 trust, the, the, the trust matter, both from politicians, but also from citizens, to, to, to my perspective. Um, Precious, um, in, uh, in, 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 in South Africa, um, from, from your perspective, um, coming back to the question, what is your experience, um, how uh, digital, technology, uh, sorry, digital technologies have been deployed to help fight the pandemic? Um, so what is your experience in that regard, uh, looking over the, the, the last six to eight months? Well, I, I thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon. Uh, the South African experience is that we, we started uh, firstly by having a, a, a digital health strategy. And, and that was important because we had, you know, worked hard to make investments, uh, investments in making sure that uh, the digital platforms uh, uh, were in place and, and well, there, there were a number of uh, uh, challenges and, and I would like to start with those in that firstly, because we had invested over a number of uh, years, we, we, we registered over, uh, you know, 43 million uh, patients in, on our health patient registration system. But it took us quite a while to, to uh, deploy, you know, the systems across the whole country in all clinics. In fact, we could only uh, uh, deploy this in clinics, not even in, in hospitals because of the complexities of, of the, of the hospital-based systems. So this is the, the first uh, step that we took over a number of years. But as we're you know, doing this, when COVID hit, we, we had to look at a various uh, uh, digital uh, tools that are already in existence. Like for instance, we had what we call Mom Connect, uh, based on our M Health strategy, which was used for antenatal care, and we used this as a platform that was used for for information uh, dissemination. In in that we sort of uh, develop a number of applications apps. One was intended uh, for contact tracing. And I always say that contact tracing must not be techno surveillance, uh, which, which is a risk that is likely to happen. Uh, secondly, we, we also had a, a tools that could, for instance, be used for self-screening for COVID-related symptoms. And at a, at a population level, we've, we've had a, the district health information system. I think it's a, it's a, a system that is used for re, routine data collection. And, and it's used, the, the risk that we've always had over time is that because of a, a lack of interoperability, we had multiple systems that did not talk to each other. And I think uh, uh, Bernardo uh, referred uh, to this uh, somehow, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that all these platforms that we had developed over the years have actually come in handy in that we're able to connect uh, all of these. But it is not just uh, tools that are used for the health systems. It's also tools that are used for patients themselves, for citizens themselves to monitor, to monitor whether they, they have COVID or not so that they do not you know, uh, uh, come to our facilities when, when, when it's a risk uh, to do so. But what, what is uh, happening is that we've also had other tools like the uh, ATM pharmacy that have been rolled across the whole country. And the nice thing about some of these tools uh, uh, that we've developed is that they've actually avoided 
having people come to the facilities when they don't need to. For instance, for collection of medicines, they don't have to come to facilities. The area that we could have done better and you know we could have invested over a number of years is on telemedicine. We have, but it's only in selected areas and, and areas where I, I would describe as centers of excellence. They are not widely implemented and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a lost uh, opportunity. Uh, for those uh, facilities that have systems in place, it has been very useful to collect data because we are able to see and track uh, uh, patients and to know uh, how well we are doing on COVID. For instance, the number of hospitalizations, uh, the number of patients that are you know, uh, positive and number of patients that uh, have recovered. Uh, these systems we've built over time and, and we've learned from the experience of HIV and AIDS. As you know, South Africa has a high burden of HIV and AIDS. So those systems have actually been very, very helpful for us. And we've used some of the platforms uh, uh, you know, for COVID and we took advantage of that. I, I, I just want to, to raise a few points that I think uh, we need to note. One, there are just too many applications and the risk is that you then get a pay, a information overload. Not only information overload, but a risk of misinformation. And this sometimes undermine our efforts uh, to contain and, and mitigate you know, uh, COVID. So, uh, so we need some governance framework so that we can see what kind of apps are out there and, and regulate them and whilst promoting innovation. We want innovation, but ensure that uh, it can be trusted and it can be used appropriately and it can benefit uh, society. So one, governance structures are important, but we still have infrastructure problems, as you know. Uh, the cost of connectivity is a barrier and also interoperable uh, digital health systems and solutions. Not all of them are interoperable. Uh, so it's one hurdle we have to address. We do have uh, some legal framework and they are being implemented. And these are intended to deal with data protection, consent to use a uh, privacy and security. And one thing is to invest in digital skills so that the management of big data and the capacity to do so exists. Uh, I thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much, Precious. That, that was very interesting insight. I, um, what I take uh, is what you said at, at, at the end. You need a digital strategy, you need a legal framework and digital skills. And I think we will come back also to the point you're saying, um, how can we avoid the information overload? Uh, the fact that uh, there is too many applications uh, which we which we deal and uh, particularly citizens also deal. I'm taking the opportunity to to call on <clears throat> participants in the in in the, in this in this great session, inspiring session to uh, put uh, questions or comments in in the chat or in the Q and A section that you see on the in in the bottom uh, row below your 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 screen. Um, they are forwarded to me so that we can integrate them further in the in the discussion. Um, uh, Arunada, uh, Gupta, um, let's, let's have a look a little bit uh, further, uh, going a little bit beyond the pandemic. How could digital innovation help to protect health of our people in more effective, efficient and accountable manner? Uh, we have seen um, so far, we have looked more in the aspects how to, to manage um, the, the pandemic when, 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 it's, when it's there, when, when, when you have to avoid overload over the, the, the health system. Uh, that, that is all related to, to tracking, for instance, um, uh, orientating people to the right service, uh, the triage questions we had. But in, in, in the more forward-looking um, forward terms, uh, how could digital innovation have to protect from, from people uh, from, from now? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure whether everybody's aware that Gavi ha has a massive uh, scale of operations. So we actually support uh, more than 70 countries 
in expanding life-saving vaccination uh, to about 80 million children every year. So in the countries that, that we support, uh, there are 80 uh, million children born every year who need to be vaccinated. And, and we are looking at uh, about half a billion uh, vaccine shots you know, that, are, that are provided to these uh, children because they have to be protected against a range of, of diseases. So clearly, you know, it, these are big investments and, and uh, big operations. And uh, some of the speakers actually touched on this whole dimension of a private sector and a private public sector partnership. And Gavi actually uh, was uh, set up uh, at the turn of the millennium in 2000 as a public-private partnership. And, and uh, the whole idea was uh, to set up a unique alliance that can leverage uh, the, the comparative advantage of both uh, public sector and, and private sector. And, and therefore, we have been able to leverage a lot of uh, innovations in taking immunization to those countries and to those poor households, you know, where it wouldn't have re reached without these, these efforts. And we have indeed exploited uh, digital technology a lot as, as we have tried uh, to do this. So typically, I like to say, that vaccination happens when three V's come together. And these three V's are uh, the vaccine, uh, vaccinator, and vaccine. So you need these three V's at the same time, because if you don't have vaccine, you know, then you can't vaccinate children. If you don't have vaccinator, uh, vaccination will not happen. And vaccine is the child who has to be brought, you know, by the by the caregiver. So really the three Vs have to come together. And on each of these three Vs, actually we have exploited a, a, a variety of technologies, including digital uh, technologies. Uh, for example, on, on vaccine, you know, we use a lot of um, uh, 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 digital technology to make sure that we have a vaccine logistic management uh, systems so that we have end-to-end -end visibility on how these vaccines are, are traveling, you know, and how stocks are being managed and, and really the level of uh, consumption of, of these vaccines. There are some very interesting innovations that we have done. For example, remote uh, uh, temperature monitoring, you know, and this is, you know, so we have uh, data loggers and we have uh, temperature monitors that are put in the cold chain, which actually start to send digital messages uh, to managers when there are temperature excursions, because what uh, temp uh, vaccines have to be kept at a certain temperature. So if, if there are temperature ex excursions, then, you know, the potency of vaccines is lost. So when we didn't have these digital technologies, we could actually be vaccinating children, but not immunizing them or protecting them because the vaccine could have lost its, its potency. So these kind of investments are helping us increase both efficiency and, and effectiveness of, of our uh, interventions. Another on vaccine, for example, you know, one of the biggest big breakthroughs is by way of electronic uh, uh, immunization registries. Because a lot of these countries that we work in actually have very weak health systems, but they also do not have civil registration of births and deaths. So clearly the, the denominator is very unclear. What is the target population? You know, uh, the uh, children do not have uh, identities. So, so therefore what we are trying trying to do is to set up uh, electronic registries of immunization so that the health workers absolutely understand who are the children who have to be systematically reached uh, with, with uh, different uh, doses of, of vaccines. In terms of vaccinators, uh, we, have, uh, we have invested a lot in, in uh, scaling up digital technologies for their skills enhancement. You know, skills are important. And if vaccinators do not have those skills, and particularly as we deploy new vaccines, because there are new precautions and new regimens that, that vaccinators have to be made aware of. So, so we, we have found this extremely, extremely convenient to do capacity building at scale in a much more efficient and effective manner. And the last thing is the vaccinee. How do we work with communities and caregivers 
to spur demand. So we have one, we have lack of demand in some settings where the benefits of immunization are not known. So we are using digital technologies, including mobile phones, SMS, and all kinds of things to make sure that caregivers are made increasingly aware of the benefits of immunization. But there's also a lot of misinformation, as you know. And, mm -hmm. and we think that good information is the best antidote to bad information. And therefore, you know, just making sure that we, we make use of technology to counter false propaganda and, and rumors. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, to, to, from your perspective, uh, what is the point that have um, deciders all over the world, when you look at the, the, the global scale, learned first um, when it comes to the link of uh, di digital innovation, digital systems, and managing such kind of crisis? What was the first thing really that, that, that uh, triggered people? Yeah, so I, I really think it is, you know, it is lack of uh, sort of, uh, or it is dwindling uh, sort of opportunities to have a physical contact. You know, because in a pandemic situation where we are increasingly talking about lockdowns and social distancing, people, people sort of one of the things that we realized was that there was wide scale disruption of health services in countries that we support. And actually among health uh, services that were disrupted, immunization was the worst hit. And that was because of two reasons primarily, because there were fears uh, among the caregivers, you know, mothers did not want to bring their children to facilities any longer for immunization, but also the health workers were very fearful of catching infection. They were also redeployed in many cases. So therefore, you know, the whole ecosystem got completely topsy turvy And that is, I think, was a, a, that is what put pressure on the system to start to think very innovatively. And we saw that a lot of digital tools that we, we have been deploying, but which hadn't been really scaled up, you know, in, in many cases actually were, were, were really sort of, uh, you know, adopted at a pace and at a scale which is unprecedented. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Agrawal, uh, last but not least, um, same question um, to you after uh, the intervention of, of, of your colleagues and from, from your perspective, um, uh, what is the main point where digital innovation uh, will help in the future um, to, uh, to, to make people more resilient, um, to, to make health uh, more uh, efficient um, to, to, to citizens, to, to people? What, what is from your perspective the main point here? Uh, thank you, Patrick. I take forward on Radha's point, which was a great example of how digital is making something essentially physical, right? I mean, when you vaccinate somebody, there is a human at both ends and you're giving a vaccine, a physical thing. Uh, and digital can enable even that. But there are at least three more levels that you can see where digital will change medicine. The next most obvious level is the people are still there. They're still a doctor. There is still a patient, but the medium of communication is entirely digital, that's telemedicine. If you take one level further from that, there is a patient, it's digitally connected, but the person on the other end is not a human being. It could be a chatbot, it could be an algorithm, it could be giving answers. And the last level, which I think we will see very soon, will be digital digital. The person does not really exist for the healthcare, it's a digital twin. Uh, lots of variable devices creating a digital image of a person that is continuously being analyzed by digital algorithms. Only when the two find something that is worth communicating to the physical world does the information come to the physical world. Each of these levels is possible. And in the field that I come from, genomics, for example, digital is not optional, it is essential. There is no possible way in which any human being can look at billions of bases of a human being and figure out anything. So the way I see digital transforming health is number one in, for example, countries like India. India does not have to be. The number of doctors per thousand people is less than one. WHO recommends one. If we count all type of doctors, India barely hits one, but otherwise it's less. Uh, Europe, for example, is typically four. 
And in most of countries similar to India, the doctors are very unevenly distributed. So you need digital to create the connections. And if you can use your less skilled manpower and upgrade their skills, you don't even need full AI for that, just simple intelligence augmentation algorithms, uh, putting basic guidelines into practice that can be done. You need smart infrastructure that's going to change everything. And as we move up the chain, we will see more and more of examples where human comprehension and ability becomes limiting at the cutting edge of medicine. And there will be at least assistance and perhaps at some point, a bit of autonomy for digital medical systems. At least in genomics, I can tell you, what we finally practice is what comes out of very strong, rigorously tested pipelines. And this is what we will see in the digital medicine of the future. At some point, we cannot exactly comprehend everything that is done, but we run very rigorous tests to make sure the system works well. We try to make it fast. There is nothing faster than digital. There is nothing more scalable. The most important part is, does it work? And that's something we'll be spending a lot of time on in the time to come to make sure that we don't get blinded only by the speed and the scale. We also continue to imagine, is it really helping people? And that's something only time will tell. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. That that's really a, a, a far beyond outlook that, that you present here. Um, but I understand instantly that um, from your perspective, digital can be a solution where it will be very difficult to make sure that the classical services, the classical health services that we know in some countries apply to everyone on, on, on earth. I think that is the, the, the background for, for, from, which, from which you come. How do you see the, 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 the trust uh, item that we had uh, several times in the discussion here when um, you deploy this kind of vision? That is such a phenomenal follow-up question. I think trust is central. When the time comes that algorithms are telling doctors what to do and will come soon, and doctors not necessarily being known for the mathematical skills are unable to fully comprehend the reason, but they can only see the data showing outcomes and the algorithm works. Trust is going to be central. Patients fundamentally trust doctors, not algorithms. Doctors trust hard quality clinical outcomes, controlled trials, that data needs to be generated. And governance needs to be both lean and balanced. I mean, sometimes you think these words are uh, impossible, but it has to be. You have to figure out a way in which data can grow rapidly. Trust is high within the system for everybody. And the only way that comes is transparency. In my opinion, when everything is transparent, when doctors know the data from the trials, the outcomes they are being shown, every step of it, whether it be by blockchains or by any other methods, non-tampered, original, visible to everybody, then that transparency will bring trust. That trust will bring uh, the progress in the field we all want to see. So mm. transparency at the end. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you are really convinced about uh, the, 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 the vision that, that you're presenting. I'm, I'm looking at um, the chat here and the Q&As that, that coming in that, that uh, are um, uh, more and more. Um, and they are, they are um, pointing to, to two points. Uh, one, obviously, is uh, how to ensure the right to privacy. Uh, is, is respected uh, regarding dig digitalization of, of health data. I mean, I, I think that is really a, a big challenge and that is a discussion uh, on, on the whole, whole world. We see it here in Germany, we have had um, intensive discussion about a simple tracing app, which is completely decentralized. It's not interoperational with other, other ones. And even here, it was difficult to, 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 to bring it to the, to, to the, to the people. And the second one is uh, about the, the, the link between the public and private ecosystem, uh, because the, the, the aspect of commercialization was, was raised. And I understand when I look at the questions that there is a, a, a massive, um, I wouldn't say fear, but uh, there, there is, uh, who is driving it? That is the question. So is the commercial side driving it? Or what about governor, government? What, what about civil society? Who is setting the standards um, to, uh, to, to uh, go forward 
um, with digital technology in the in the health system. Maybe let's pick one one by one. I'm turning to Bernardo again because I think you mentioned that very at the beginning. Um, uh, the uh, the privacy issue uh, regarding digitalization of health data. Where's the challenge here, Bernardo? Uh, thank you. I think so. First, the first challenge really is, is the fact that uh, digital and health they are two different. Uh, they have two different cultures, right? So you have uh, uh, the culture of uh, of monetization of data and the digital tech, and you have the culture of uh, donation we do we, we donate blood we donate organs in the health and life science and 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 to conciliate uh, uh, i think anurag was, was was mentioning that that how we we conciliate the two extremes in such a way that we add and we bring we extract the value that both ends can bring and we bring those benefits that we all want to see so the privacy and 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 data sharing, or, or, or it's, it's those are the, the two or other two extremes where how we can ensure that uh, that uh, we ex extract the benefit of, benefit of health data to for health benefit for health outcomes, and also we do not uh, um, harm people because in health science in life science do not harm is very enshrined in, in, in the culture of, 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 of medicine, the medical doctors and health specialists. So from our perspective, in, in what we did and we're doing, we propose in our global strategy on digital health, a framework of, to, to regulate um, uh, uh, for international regulation of health data. When it is, it's, 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 it's a framework that we need to put in place that address both the privacy, but also allow the digital technologies to, to leverage and, on, on that data to bring those health benefits we are all looking for without um, um, infringing on privacy or without infringing on, 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 on ethical consideration. Now, I, our strategy say people at the center. And, and to build a trust ecosystem, we need not just a private, public-private partnership. We need to bring the, the academia, the civil society. I think there was a question there as well. So there are other stakeholders that need to be in the discussion. At WHO, we're creating what we call a network of networks. Because today, and in, 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 in we have a, a, a culture, and we have to, I mean, I want, I want to dwell a little bit on this culture, because we, we are creatures of habits. Now, Many institutions were created after the Second World War, and the, 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 the framework we work is, is, is it was to address the challenges we had at that time. We have new challenges. We, have the, we are in digital age. This is the, the first pandemic in the digital age. So we need new rules, new engagement, new normal. And I think to, bring, to, make, to, to make sure that we, there's a trusted uh, ecosystem, we need to bring all these stakeholders together. So the power of WHO is to bring, to create a convening element to bring these ent different entities in the ecosystem and create what, could, what, what we can all trust, be it a framework of regulating health, uh, uh, international health data, uh, or be it a framework to, to be, be, create an interoperability or others. But uh, we have systems and, and players that we need to bring together to work in a new normal and bring the players that we normally don't interact with, even at WHO. We do, we, our tradition is not interact with private sector. So we had to step up and, and start that engagement. But the understanding that we have two, ex, two extremes that we need to negotiate bring and bring those benefits to, to, the, to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernardo. That was very clear. Precious um, to, uh, to, to your experience, when uh, you started saying uh, the most important thing is that you have a digital health strategy uh, if I understood correctly, uh, and you base a, a lot of things that were set up now for the pandemic on the fact that you already had a kind of uh, a digital health strategy, which gives you a frame for work to, 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 to work on new applications, for instance, to, to, to widen the scope. So uh, from your perspective, um, who are the, the, the important stakeholders to design that trust uh, in, in, this, in these applications? particularly from a data protection point of view. 
Well, firstly, I think we we need to to have the most uh, components uh, 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 to be in place. Uh, firstly, we must have a digital health governance that recognizes that uh, digital health is not just for the health sector only. It must involve uh, different ministries, uh, ministries of communication, of health, finance, uh, and also uh, uh, ministries of education. So you need within that uh, governance framework to involve different uh, sectors. And secondly, you need to engage a different uh, 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 sectors, like we said, public, private, civil society organization and academia. But it, it is not just enough to, to engage them. It, it is also to understand, for instance, in South Africa, what we did when we started our work on, on, on development of the digital health uh, strategy, we started with e-health strategy and m-health strategy. And whilst we did that, we, we looked at all the digital tools that were in both the public and the private sector. We came up with a, a, a normative framework to assess all the, the, the tools, both in the public and private. It was a very useful exercise in that we could see the weaknesses and the strength from both sectors. So those systems that worked, those that didn't, and those that we could build on. So, so it was a very useful uh, experience, but it, it's not enough to, to build systems around patients when you don't involve them. And I, I agree with uh, uh, Bernardo that whatever systems we, de we develop, uh, they be in the public or private sector, they must put the patient at the center. In fact, I don't say patient because sometimes you are not necessarily sick to use the systems. It is about well-being. So you must, it, they must be people-centered. People-centered because when you are a patient, you're already sick. So for those who are not sick, but who need to use digital tools for their own well-being. They still need to access those digital tools. So we must make them people-centric. And I think this is an approach uh, that we've been uh, developing. And the digital tools cannot just be for those who work in the health system. Uh, we need also digital literacy, digital literacy so that with this people-centered approach, those who need to use these tools must also have skills to do so. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Precious, for that. Is there uh, a, a, something that you want to contribute to? Uh, I, I'm. A, it's an open question to the to the panel. Any contribution to this uh, to this thesis that have been deployed here? Kira, Kira, I'm looking a little bit uh, to you because, um, uh, particularly, the um, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm correct by interpreting the, the term. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, triage. This, this is something that, from an ethical point of view, uh, can can be seen very, 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 very difficult. Um, and uh, we are talking here about how digital systems. Uh, can take decisions by by artificial in intelligence that has been mentioned in in, in a couple of times. Um, so and that that seems for many many people very very unusual and pot potentially dangerous also. So who is taking the decisions? How how are these de de systems is designed? When when I, as a former journalist, I, I, I temper to the you know to the point. So. Very quickly, the concept of clinical triage has been deployed for hundreds of years. So patients should be treated by their urgency. The problem is today how it's being done. It's being done either by sort of protocol manually. And this is a lot of the problem in getting healthcare to be streamlined. Knowing which patients need to go where is of an extreme importance for running a healthcare system. I'll give you an example. If everybody goes to the emergency department like they do today, Okay. We're not going to have uh, enough time for patients that are acute. Today, only in the U.S., there's uh, $200 billion spent on avoidable emergency department visits that could have been handled somewhere else. 
However, I do agree with you that when developing uh, artificial intelligence systems, and in general, any type of protocol, especially in healthcare, you need to think about fairness. Uh, there was a very nice paper published uh, in Science approximately a year and a half ago about the fact that proactive algorithms predicting which patients will deteriorate are unfair to the Afro-American community in the United States. The reason was they were ranked lower is they were receiving less attention from the medical setting in general in the previous years, and the algorithm identified that patients that are costly have a higher probability of doing a preventable inpatient visit in the future. It created a full bias in the way the algorithm does recommendations. So it's a bleeding edge uh, research topic about how to make those algorithms more fair. And I think it's our responsibility as the scientists here to provide systems that are explainable. In other words, there are decision support systems that are not making the decision and to be as transparent as possible. And there is several mathematical uh, algorithms to actually ensure the fairness across several subgroups while not hurting performance. So I definitely agree that in uh, clinical aspects, you have to uh, understand how to do it uh, uh, correctly. It doesn't mean that we should not do it because the problem is currently we're losing the fight uh, in a scale. Okay, As uh, Anurag was mentioning, uh, it's unthought of that we're going to have uh, a system running uh, on thousands, billions of data points and thinking a human can actually do it. So we need to change the way we think and move to a more digital world like we've already done in finance, for example. So why not even in healthcare? It doesn't mean we're not gonna have the human touch. It means that we're gonna have more human touch because doctors can actually do more face-to-face -face meetings instead of doing the administrative work. A few hundred uh, years ago, they were having 200, 400 patients for a primary care physician. Today, it's 2,000, maybe 5,000 in seven countries. It doesn't scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agrawal. Um, I'm sure um, <clears throat> you also have uh, some thoughts about uh, this, this aspect. Yeah, I do. I mean, my first thought on privacy is it's a very, very local context. I mean, uh, if you look at the GDPR versions in Europe versus other laws elsewhere, it all depends on how you perceive health data and its use or misuse. The reason for privacy is primarily not one of uh, simple choice. It's one of preventing misuse. And how you go about handling health data to make healthcare systems better, but preventing misuse is a very dynamic and evolving field. To illustrate the point, if somebody was able to download your data and misuse it, that's clearly a bad idea. However, if your data was to stay secure, what algorithms were able to utilize it to tune themselves, to develop better parameters, nobody actually has lost anything. I think we are at the beginning of an age of computer science, where many things that are possible are not fully understood by the public. It is entirely possible for your data to stay on your phone and by federated learning for the algorithms that work on the data to get better and better and better. So you get a better experience. There is nothing wrong in it. Similarly, genomes can be downloaded. They can stay in the same place. My institute probably has the largest collection of genomes in the country. We would not want to let people download it fully because you can always crack a genome back to some degree to the second relative at the very least, especially in a country like India, uh, where people are very related because of lack of intermingling of communities over 2000 years. But at the same time, we would want that precision health systems catering to Indians become better. And that's very important why. Recently, we did 1000 genomes for Indians. We discovered 13 million new genetic variants not described in any genomic data across the world at that point. I assure you, if this kind of a study, 1,000 whole genomes is done in Africa, you will find another 15 million. The genomic data is very dominated by white Western European data. I mean, I'm counting America as a Western European for this purpose. And yet you must make this data available around the world. It should not simply become a point after you spend a few thousand dollars on sequencing somebody, nobody will get to use this data. I think there's a lot more to be said. We must prevent misuse, yes, 
but we must lock data up so that nobody can use it until the explicit complicated permission. No, I'll stop here for the time being. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That's a very interesting uh, point, obviously. Uh, and I see um, a very lively debate here in the, in, in the chat about uh, these, these um, uh, questions. Uh, there is a question on uh, have there already been cases of ransomware against companies, multilateral organizations or hospitals and clinics regarding COVID-19 investigations of patient data that, that links very practically to how to secure the, 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 the system. Uh, the systems and uh, then there is also this um, this, this more ethical this discussion about who is taking decisions and where is the interface between human being and uh, and, and the uh, dig digital world i think that that is something that is uh, really to shape for the for the future um, as we see that there is a big potential in in digital technology and at the same time it is entering a space where we didn't expect it maybe uh, so much. It's, it's quite different to be used, to use a mobile phone to chat with your friends, your family uh, or your peers, or to see your doctor only on the mobile phone and sending some data to the doctor for consultation. Um, Anurada, very, very, very short, because I want to move to the next uh, step in the discussion to, to look a little bit in the, in the future and to start developing some recommendations, some points that you want to give to the community to deal with that challenges. But um, one, one, one point again on, on, on trust, if, why you have this experience with, with vaccination, which, which implies a direct contact. Uh, tell us very briefly wh uh, wh where you see the, the, the fact that one must work most if you turn more health services into digital? What is the, the point to, to, to taper, to make that work? Yeah, so I think we have to be very deliberate about how we uh, choose to use digital technologies. And I think you, the uh, value of human interface uh, also needs to be appreciated. So I think that's the point that was being made by Anurag also. That on the so whatever we can digitize, we absolutely must, right? For example, we are now doing intelligent dashboards to understand just the functionality of cold chain, right? And and uh, to the point that Anurag was making, would you argue that that country should not be uploading that data, or would you argue that that data is good for global good, right? So so I think that's one debate. But the second is that the trust. That, that communities repose in frontline health workers and their, their providers should not be underestimated. And, and therefore, you know, I think that that human interface and human intervention will continue to be uh, extremely critical. One thing that I, I think that hasn't been touched and I, I is about equity. So I, uh, we talked about fairness, but I would really want to sort of highlight that if we, uh, we have to make sure that the digital divide that already exists is not exacerbated, you know, and, and that we, we do, the pendulum does not swing to the other end and we lose sight of uh, the fact that there is highly inequitable access to uh, technology and digital technology. And that if we are uh, serious about uh, SDG, uh, which has a unifying aspiration of leaving no one behind, then that is something that must absolutely be kept in mind. Thank you very much. That is um, exactly the, the point where I wanted to come uh, now. Uh, we are not equal in our online. Um, we have discussed that the systems are uh, quite uh, differently set up in different regions of the world. Roughly half of the planet is still unconnected. Many are not meaningful uh, connected. Most of them in remote areas, often rural areas, in other words, digital technologies are not accessible to all and uh, often they're not equally access accessible. And it seems to me that uh, it, it, it builds on, 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 a, um, uh, on, on, a, on a situation that we have seen before that, that many vulnerables that have been vulnerable to other conditions are also vulnerable to to digi digital improvement somehow, because that is exactly the groups um, that, that we need to connect. Now, here's the question, how to ensure that digital health care deliver for all? Um, and how do we make sure that we are not leaving someone 
behind. Um, I would turn to a very structured um, approach now and give you one by one again, two to three minutes uh, to give us some very uh, practical point from, from, from your standpoint, from your experience, how we have to uh, make sure that digital health uh, innovation delivers for all and uh, we make sure that uh, no one uh, is, is left behind. Let's start with Bernardo again. Uh, uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, I think we some some of some panelists alluded to this the the issue about uh, what we challenge we have in the physical world and the challenges that uh, we have in the digital world. So I think we we need and some some leaders are, are already starting to 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 also discuss and and recognize that we need new the new rules in the digital world that are because of the, trying to trans, transform the physical the rules in the physical world to the digital does not necessarily work and on equity i wanted to also make sure that we i mean we don't forget the gender equality in addition to health equity approach but also accessibility for people with disabilities as we create this digital ecosystem and and from from our perspective um and 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 we see it as our role to support countries as they develop those digital health strategies to ensure that those those are included. But on, on I mean, I, I, I think on, on we today and 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 Anurad mentioned we have the digital divide. Half of close to half of the world still don't have access to broadband. So so we work the way we 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 are trying to address that is to to ensure that. Um, the, that the, as we promote the digital, the use of digital technologies, we also promote the accessibility to those that are not connected by working with the, the entities that are, are, are working on the ground with countries to ensure connectivity. So, so we have the ITUs, we have, uh, uh, we, we have uh, the national governments to ensure that, that, that uh, and, and I think uh, um, even Precious mentioned, it's not just an issue of health, it's an issue of finance, technology. So, so, so be, bring, bringing those um, entities together to address those multiple challenges, but also un, in understand that we are in the digital world that requires new sets of rules, standards, and framework to ensure that, uh, that we ripe all the benefits. It's, it's at the center of, of what we have in the global strategy on digital health, where, where, where we, 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 we plan to implement a number of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, solutions, frameworks, and, 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 and technologies to ensure that we all ripe the, the benefits that, uh, that, that the digital technology can bring. So, so yes, we uh, are recognizing that uh, the fact that uh, this, the, the world is unequal, is not equal, but also we are recognizing that uh, that uh, that by working with the different countries at all levels, so with, uh, can, even a community level, because we uh, can we cannot forget the the the, the community health workers that uh, that require the skills and, and 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 knowledge to ensure that we transcend and we create that transformation of digital in such a way that we bring benefits. So working together is key. In working together in a different way than we have been working in the past is very key to ensure that we bring those benefits. Thank you very much, Bernardo. Uh, Precious. Yes, uh, thank you. We have to address the fulcrum of inequality and inequity. And, and to do that, we have to reset and reform our health system so that we can meet the challenges of digital health advances. As, as we do that, it must be with the explicit purpose of improving access and ensuring that regulatory safeguards uh, are in place. Now, in, in resource constraint settings, the investments in human capacity development are important. They're important because they need to match this digital revolution. What uh, Anorak was saying, in, in countries where the basics are needed, we, we need to ensure that we can benefit from both high-tech technology and the basic day-to-day -day 
things that can help us improve access to quality health care. So this must ensure that the health system in, is transformed. The health system as we know it, it must be transformed in such a way that service delivery is improved. But it must be done in such a way that the users of services are empowered. They're empowered to manage and monitor their own health so that they do not run to health facilities for every small health problem. And if this is the case, it must help us reduce costs and ensure that health is affordable and accessible. But that extension of services is also for the benefit of those who are in remote settings, those that are in rural environments. It cannot be that when you have a particular address, then it's a disadvantage and it doesn't allow you to access healthcare. So your geographic location must no longer be a barrier uh, to access. So we have an opportunity, an opportunity to improve health outcomes and an opportunity to improve the effectiveness of our patient management with these uh, digital decision tools that Rika referred to earlier. Of course, this will improve uh, our targets for the SDGs and SDG uh, in 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much, Precious. Uh, let me let me uh, point a little bit on 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 this. I, I do I understand you correctly that your hope is that with digital technology and if, if you organize the acceptance and the skills you can overcome is injustice in access to health uh, services that is your perspective while when i understand bernardo correctly he's fearing a little more a little bit more than that um, digital health di digital based health services risk to mirror the, the circumstances that we have in the in the physical in the physical world and are, are not necessarily overcoming this this in 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 injustice. Um, shake your head if 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 I'm correct. There is a risk of mirroring if you are not looking at the whole infrastructure in in a, in 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 a, in, a, in a country. Uh, Anurada, I'm 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 turning to you now. Do, which which side do you had a little bit more to Bernardo or to Precious? <laughs> Let me say uh, something, you know, here because we are working a lot on uh, understanding inequities in immunization. Immunization is one of the most equitable interventions among primary health uh, care, and and therefore, you know, we we have been trying to study why if, uh, 11 million children in Gavi supported countries do not receive even a single dose of the most basic mm -hmm. vaccine. And for us, that child, and we call him, I call that child zero dose child is actually an acute marker of inequity. And you would be surprised by what we, we discovered. You know, what we discovered was that contrary to this popular notion that these children are living in remote areas, you know, it is all about last mile delivery. Actually, a lot of them are living right under the nose of the governments in capitals, in urban slums, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these children actually exist in every village and every mm -hmm. town because actually the barriers that are operating you know, against access to these populations uh, are embedded in poverty. You know, two out of three zero dose children live in households that, that, that subsist on less than $1.90 a day. So there is a connection between extreme poverty and, and, and zero dose uh, children. Ethnicity is a big barrier and then gender barriers, you know, because, because the mother is not educated, mother is not empowered, she doesn't have agency. So, there are complex uh, predictors and stratifiers of these inequities. So my first uh, humble appeal here is not to uh, synonymize inequities with geographical locations, which are difficult to access. Now, the next uh, insight that I would want to share is, therefore, it is possible for us to actually use big data and, and artificial intelligence to triangulate 
very complex data sources to understand where exactly these marginalized populations live and what exactly are their latent profiles. Why is it that they are missing all those? So it's not connect. Uh, this is not directly linked to a connectivity issue or the issue or the challenge of digital divide. We can still use or leverage technologies to improve access for marginalized populations. And the last thing I would say is that, you know, the level of technology that exists in some of the remotest areas that are not connected is highly variable. So, you know, and we really therefore have to think about differentiated and contextualized approaches. For example, in some of the countries we found that the use of mobile phones, right, and uh, could actually exacerbate the, the gender divide because women did not have ownership of mobile phones. Whereas in some other context, we found that there was high ownership on the part of women, you know, of, of mobile phones. So I just think that just uh, retaining that ability to actually study habitation by habitation, community by community, some of the barriers, and then making an intelligent uh, sort of decision about how do we leverage technology would be extremely important. Mm. Thank you very much, Anurag. A very good example. Um, Anurag, uh, again, how to ensure digital health care delivers for all. Thanks a lot. I'm going to make a start with a comment. One of the most precious comments today was made by Precious, and her point was how do you keep people from unnecessarily visiting healthcare systems? That is absolutely critical in most overloaded systems. In India, the average time for a patient to be seen by a doctor is under five minutes. Of that, 50% of the time is in prescription refills and basic uh, measurements. You want to extract the maximum value of every time every patient spends with an experienced medical personnel and minimize the wastage of time uh, otherwise. So you must allow people with non-specific complaints to get advice in their own houses conveniently, such that they don't visit doctors. You must enable the system with a sphere of digital public health goods. These have to be built by the government, so they remain low cost. How the government will pay for them is a question I leave for smarter people like Bernardo. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, after these basic health services are taken care of. And internationally, we have to find models. On top of it, you need the private sector to create the innovative ecosystem for more and more higher quality products. So I see both Bernardo's vision that even in the end, there will be high cost, differentiated products not available for everybody. Whether you stay analog, whether you stay digital, it will not matter. But essential good services should be available to everybody by public digital health goods and a commitment towards making sure that basic medical advice can be given to people without having to leave their houses, without having to waste time in which they could have gone and earned a wage. Uh, huge number of people get into poverty because they're unnecessarily going around uh, all over the place, wasting daily wages and getting answers that could have easily come to their houses. Mm. And I'll stop here. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, this um, contribution, particularly on uh, on on this this human human interface that that you are mentioning. And, uh, I can share from 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 Germany that the impression here, when you look at uh, studies, are always the uh, the relation between patient and doctor. You also see that many many visits are, from a health perspective, obsolete. Uh, it's it's more obviously a social thing. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's more kind of uh, to have contact, that, which applies uh, obviously to to many elderly people that are doing kind of doctor hopping also, and that that is that is filling the waiting rooms and that is uh, challenging the the system. But on the other hand, it's it's a need. Uh, but the, the question is is there is, is it the right place to to fill that uh, that need? Obviously. Thank you very much. A very interesting point, I think. Kira, how to make sure that uh, digital healthcare delivers for all? So I'll touch on several points. Uh, one is uh, similar to what I've talked before. There's several algorithmic methods showing that an AR algorithm is fair. Uh, 
But I think let's talk about virtual care. It actually brought the notion of democratization of healthcare. Everybody can get a doctor, no matter where they are, uh, no matter in which home they live, to get the best doctors no matter where they are. The problem is access. Even in virtual care, 75% of the population even in Western countries doesn't know they have the possibility of using virtual care. And I'm talking not about poor people. Most people just don't know they can have this. So we need to work a lot about education around this. Maybe this would be part of the education at school. Use virtual care at least once. Know that you have the possibility of using something that's gonna change your life dramatically. Mm -hmm. This is number two. And number three is again, education, even for uh, physicians. Uh, physicians in different countries have different education times, different training. And I think building decision support systems across all of the data of all of the world in the best institutions and giving access to those decision support systems for physicians during training in other countries is gonna help spread the knowledge in a much more equal and fair way. Thank you very much. That's very clear. So last step in, 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 in our panel, and I'm asking you to be even, even, even more concise than you have been to in your contributions so far. Now, when we, when we look at what we have said, what would be the policy message or the concrete action point or recommendation that should come out from that panel when we look at the points that we have discussed uh, before? So I'm, I'm really looking at the clock now. You, you, you are all very experienced in uh, shaping policy messages or knowing what one should do and what would be the, the message that comes out of that panel to, to challenge uh, what we have ahead of us to make match the digital world and the, head, the, the health world for, for, for best purpose, for best service for the, for the patient. So uh, what, what, is, what is what you want to see on the document when we close this session here? Anurag, starting with you, you have max one minute. Okay, what I would like to emphasize is digital health is not just usual health done in a digital way. It requires a comprehensive strategy that takes into account local consideration, infrastructure and goals. And each country should have a national digital health mission suited toward its own preparedness in the digital world and the health needs of its populations. And I'm glad to see India did have a national digital health mission announced this year. Thank you very much. Very good point. Anuradha. So I think equity in healthcare delivery uh, has to be a prime focus now, followed by efficiency and accountability. And digital uh, health actually is an enabler. And, and we have to stay focused on these objectives and then exploit uh, digital uh, health technologies to, uh, to allocate resources much more prudently and, and, and equitably to make sure that we actually leave no one behind and we constantly improve the quality of services that are provided to population at large. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, Kira? So in addition to all the topics we raised around uh, equality, a better collaboration between government and private sector, I want to raise the concept of data sharing. I think if on a global level, each government would have shared their data from the medical uh, conclusions they've made, even during the pandemic, we could have saved so many more lives in different countries. I think getting to a point where we have a shared resource, where all researchers can work on the same data, all government have visibility even to other countries, can bring lots of breakthroughs in healthcare and treatment. Mm. Thank you very much, Kira. Very interesting point, I guess. Um, Bernardo, right. Yeah, thank you. I think from a key recommendation will be to, for certainly to, uh, to reinforce some of what some panelists have mentioned is every country should have a, a, stra a digital health strategy. Uh, with that strategy, should, that strategy should address uh, a number of issues, including health data interoperability, uh, uh, um, equities, and all others, uh, such as ethical and privacy that was mentioned. So that's first thing. Second, each country needs to understand where the country is in that in the digital health maturity. 
to 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 ensure that uh, the, which is the third part that the investments are addressing the are taking that country maturity from where it is to the next level so so by understanding the this, the maturity of the country in digital health uh, uh, implementation or use of, of digital technologies, then we can drive the investments into appropriate areas to enhance that maturity. And, 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 and last but not least is that the digital health or digital ecosystem requires a constant improvement and enhancement. 10 years of digital technology is equal to 60 years of human life. So let's make sure that we do not create strategies that are sit there for 10, 10 years and five years thinking that it still works. If a country developed a strategy five years ago, it needs to develop a new one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. I guess that this strategy must be very agile if I have gained any understanding of yes. change that is occurred by, by digital in, 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 in our world. So it's more like you know design thinking process than having a five year strategy. I fully exactly. understand that. Okay. Last but not least, um, precious. Yes, uh, we need good digital health governance and improved access. But of course, for that to work, we must invest in human capacity development so that we can match the digital revolution, ensure that we've got a sustainable infrastructure that is expandable and maintainable. It's not good to just say infrastructure. It must be expandable and maintainable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you made very, very, very clear points, I guess, and I'm, uh... I'm looking at what you have said um, earl earlier, and I think these, uh, these six um, recommendations or points that you've raised uh, is, is really at the, at the key of the, of, the, of the challenge. I particularly uh, took in, in mind uh, a, a subtopic uh, or, or a kind of cross-cutting issue that, that was um, as, as skills, um, skills on all levels to know more about uh, how digital healthcare, digital systems can work, what they can do, and skills is not only um, to know to manage them, but but also to understand how they work, which is linked to transparency that was mentioned several times. And uh, Anurag also uh, said, if the systems are transparent, and I think Kira came in in the, in the same point. That is uh, very uh, very important. And somebody said uh, digital literacy, which obviously is, is a challenge in many sectors, but uh, I keep that this is really key uh, when it comes to health, because as Bernardo said, we are, uh, we, we, we are, we are bringing together here two very different cultures when he said that uh, on one hand, um, the, the, uh, on, uh, the, the health very much is based on on, on, on um, relations between humans. And on the other hand, you have the digital world and he described how far from culture they are from one from each other. That was for me a very interesting point when he said that is something that we barely need to address, how do we make that match for any uh, operator, for, for, for any people that that is dealing with it, be it in the in the role of a doctor or a physician of a, of a scientist or in the role of a, of a, of a patient and even in the role of a, a govern, governance. I would like to thank you very, very much for that very, very inspiring uh, high, high level uh, panel. Um, thank you very much for your time, for your contributions. All this is recorded and uh, will stay on the YouTube uh, channel of the IGF uh, on the UN Web TV, so far I understand. You also can follow the chat. Thank you all for your questions, uh, your remarks that are in the chat. Some of them we could pick them, others uh, are self-explaining and interesting to see uh, because you can see what people think about uh, this, this very, very complex uh, topic. I would like to thank the organizer, the, the team behind it, Anya, Kwok, and, and, and others. And have a great day wherever you are. And I hope that the next IGF 
uh, despite the fact that this is very interesting format, uh, I, I really hope that the, uh, the, the, the physical aspect will not completely drop out in this, in, uh, in this pandemic, after this pandemic, and we will have the chance to meet in person and discuss this further as if we will keep really, the, this, this topic will really be kept on the, on the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a great day. You too.